Tinakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto Katoa, Slama Tingahari. Welcome. I'm Professor Fraser Allen, Deputy Vice Chancellor Engagement at Victoria University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the university this evening for the 2017 SAD lecture. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our honoured guest, Her Excellency Mrs. Kim Eng Lim the Malaysian High Commissioner, and to this afternoon's speaker, Malaysia's Minister of Youth and Sports, the Honourable Kairi Jamaluddin. Today's lecture takes its name from one of Victoria's most illustrious alumni, Tan Sri Halim Saad, who has forged a successful business career in Malaysia and around the world. The Saad Lecture was established in 1998 to bring prominent Malaysian speakers to Wellington to help foster stronger ties between our countries. It has been five years since the lecture was last delivered, but in keeping with plans to reinvigorate the Chair of Malay Studies, Victoria is delighted to see the Saad Lecture return. In many ways, 2017 is an auspicious time to re-establish the Saad Lecture, marking, as it does, the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between New Zealand and Malaysia. Traditionally, ties between our countries have been based on a range of shared interests, such as trade, security, defence and tourism. But there is, of course, a particularly strong relationship based around education, which has seen Malaysian students come to study in New Zealand since the 1950s under the Colombo Plan. Victoria University has been particularly lucky to have been the destination for many of these students, including Tan Sri Harlem himself, who studied here in the 1970s. Clearly, the experience left a lasting impression on him since he has gone on to establish pathways for subsequent generations of Malaysian students to come to Wellington and New Zealand via the New Zealand Accounting Degree Pathway and the New Foundation Studies Pathway, a program announced two weeks ago in Malaysia. Victoria's links with Malaysia are set to become even stronger thanks to the new Centre for Asia-Pacific Excellence focused on Southeast Asia, which will be hosted and led by Victoria in partnership with the Universities of Auckland, Waikato and Otago. Along with a second centre focused on Latin America, which Victoria will also host, this Southeast Asian centre is designed to build the Asia-Pacific capability of Kiwis, our firms and our institutions, and will draw on the expertise and experience of researchers and practitioners around New Zealand. To that end, I'm pleased to see representatives from the Asia New Zealand Foundation and the ASEAN New Zealand Business Council here today, with whom we look forward to working on these initiatives. The centres are incredibly important to New Zealand, since our future will depend heavily on forging new relationships with our neighbours, the Asia Pacific, in the Asia Pacific region, and building on existing ties like the ones we share with Malaysia. Fortunately, New Zealand and Malaysia have a strong foundation on which to build. Speaking for Victoria University alone, we currently have around 250 Malaysian students who form a thriving community and have immeasurably enriched our institution's culture. These students are ably supported by the Wellington Malaysian Students Association, an organisation which is engaged and very energetic. And as they graduate, these students will join our large Malaysian alumni network. We now have almost 1,800 Victoria graduates based in Malaysia, most of whom are Malaysian students who studied at Victoria University. This makes our Malaysian alumni the second largest cohort of Victoria graduates outside of New Zealand, second only to those based in Australia. One of the things we are proud to offer our Malaysian students is the benefit of being educated at New Zealand's capital city university. By virtue of being located in Wellington, 
We have unrivalled access to New Zealand's leaders in government, business, community groups, the diplomatic community, think tanks and NGOs. This gives us a unique ability to draw upon the national thinking and global mindedness of our capital city community. And we are, in return, we are determined to contribute to the resolution of international challenges and to prepare critically informed, globally confident, civic minded graduates. This is an interest we share with this evening's speaker. Minister Jamaluddin is a rapidly rising star of Malaysian politics his nation's youngest cabinet minister. He received his bachelor's degree in philosophy, politics and economics from St. Hugh's College, Oxford University, and a master's degree in legal and political theory from University College London. Before entering politics, he worked as a journalist, policy aide and investment banker. He has written for many major publications, including The Economist, Time and the Wall Street Journal, and serves as an airborne paratrooper and commander of the 508 Regiment in the Malaysian Territorial Army. In 2005, the World Economic Forum in Davos selected him as a young global leader, so I can think of few more qualified people to speak on how young people can be involved in politics to affect change. This question is of great interest to New Zealand as well, and I'm fascinated to hear more about the Minister's insights into this question and how Malaysia is seeking to increase youth participation in the political process. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honourable Kairi Jamaluddin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good evening. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fraser Allen, for that uh, kind uh, introduction to the 2017 Saad Lecture. Uh, Professor uh, Fraser, professors from uh, Victoria University, uh, Her Excellency, uh, ex our High Commissioner, Nato uh, Lim Kim Eng, High Commissioner of Malaysia to uh, New Zealand. Ladies and gentlemen, friends. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Victoria University for this uh, kind invitation for me to deliver the Saad Lecture this year. As uh, Fraser mentioned earlier in his introductory remarks, it's been five years uh, since the last lecture was given. So I have the tall order of uh, giving a lecture that's good enough for another five years unless, of course, you can find someone next year. And hopefully, with the reinvigoration of the chair of Malay Studies, what it was called originally, uh, we'll have more uh, speakers from Malaysia coming to Wellington, coming to Victoria University, and uh, sharing some of our experiences with our friends and, of course, our students here. Ladies and gentlemen, I arrived in, uh, in Wellington uh, this morning uh, from Auckland. Um, I've already been treated to four seasons in one day in New Zealand. Uh, it was hot and humid in, in Auckland, and uh, it is what it is in Wellington. Um, but uh, I am happy to be back in New Zealand. This is my second or third visit, my first uh, visit to Wellington. Uh, and I'm happy to be here because uh, New Zealand is uh, an old friend of Malaysia. Uh, and I hope it's, uh, it will continue to be a close friend of our country, and not just in terms of the very visible today relationship that we have in terms of New Zealand being one of the top destination for our students. We have in New Zealand alone almost 1,500 students at present uh, in New Zealand, and of course tens of thousands who have been educated uh, in New Zealand, only second to Australia in terms of your foreign alumni who have been educated at New Zealand universities. But not just that, the relationship goes far beyond that. The relationship began even before Malaysia was uh, independent in 1957, before the Federation of Malaysia was formed in 1963, in the 1940s, your brave servicemen came to what was then known as Malaya, 
during the confrontation, during the emergency, uh, and we celebrate this relationship not just in terms of its historical depth, but also what it has to offer in the future. New Zealand is our number 10 trading partner. We are your, among your top 30 trading partners. It can be better. It should be better. We should have more tourists coming both to New Zealand from Malaysia and, of course, from New Zealand to Malaysia. You must stop looking at Malaysia as your transit point on your way to London and actually get off the plane and uh, spend some time in not just Kuala Lumpur, but of course uh, other parts of, uh, of Malaysia. And this year is special because this is our 60th year of diplomatic relations. This is the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between uh, our two countries. And I feel that uh, there's a lot of scope for developing an uh, even more profound relationship with New Zealand, not just in terms of educational and, of course, youth exchange, uh, but also in terms of how New Zealand projects itself to the world and Malaysia's aspirations for the region as well. I think both our countries view uh, the Asia-Pacific region as our region. I think New Zealand has had this conversation in the past as where you see yourselves and which region you see yourselves as part of. And I think the Asia-Pacific region is certainly a region where New Zealanders identify with. And that's going to be a big part of New Zealand's future in terms of trade, investments and economic linkages. Malaysia as well. We've been working very hard, both our countries, on what was signed and concluded here, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Of course, that's changed a bit with the election of Mr. Trump in the United States. Uh, but notwithstanding that, there are many, many other multilateral agreements. There's a Malaysia. New Zealand free trade agreement, and we very much see ourselves as part of this region. Although, of course, the geography is not entirely close, the distance is still quite far, but in terms of a shared destiny, I think both our countries very much see this region as integral to our future and, of course, to our future prosperity. Today, I, I have been given the task to speak about young people in Malaysia and uh, how we can engage more with young people in Malaysia and to share some of our experiences with you today. And um, I told, uh, uh, I mentioned to Fraser that uh, I'm not going to use up the entire one hour speaking, so whatever time we have left, um, I've asked that uh, we open up uh, for any interventions, questions, answers uh, that I might be able to give, especially since I notice in the audience uh, quite a few Malaysian students here, uh, and I'm sure you'd like to challenge your minister today and uh, see what he's made of, so you're, you're free to do so. Uh, but before that, I'd like to just maybe give some introductory remarks and uh, read uh, whatever it is that uh, my office has prepared. I always frustrate my officers because I end up not reading most of what they've written, uh, but uh, let me just start uh, by reading some of the remarks that have been prepared. Um, young Malaysians and the youth in Malaysia has always been uh, central uh, to political life in Malaysia, whether on the government's benches or in the opposition. Then there are those who are apolitical, but ch channel their talents and their ideas through civil society. In general, youth in Malaysia contribute in different ways, but always have made a difference in national development. It is important to I think for those of us present here today, comprehend the complexity of uh, Malaysia before even thinking about uh, future challenges in nation building. As former British colonies, Malaysia and New Zealand share a common heritage. We are both parliamentary democracies with a, in Malaysia's uh, the case in particular, a constitutional monarchy as its head of state. We are both nations with a common law tradition and where the English language is widely used still in Malaysia and I hope in the future as well. We believe in an open economy with a free and fair trading regime. In fact, both our countries cannot continue to prosper without having a free and fair trading regime. Nevertheless, in Malaysia, we are necessitated by our historical and geographical imperatives uh, to form ourselves as a federation of 13 states with uh, a monarch uh, as the head of state, but also we also have a written federal constitution that acts as the supreme law of the land, and each state in Malaysia also has its own state constitutions with a hereditary ruler uh, or a governor. 
So in terms of per capita, we have the most royalty in the world. In Malaysia, there is a central bicameral parliament. You have a unicameral one here in New Zealand, and also 13 provincial or state assemblies. A prime minister heading the federal cabinet and 13 chief ministers at the head of their respective state or regional executive councils. The federal constitution demarcates legislative powers amongst the federation and states. And adding to this complexity is the three-tier government at the federal, state and local level. And the judicial structure in Malaysia is federal in nature, although the religious courts in every state for the religion of Islam is uh, governed by the state and the native court in Sabah are under the jurisdiction of states. And that's the complex nature of governance in Malaysia and how young people fit in to this structure is most interesting. The age of voting in Malaysia at the moment is still 21. In the last general election, up to 3 million new voters registered for the first time. It was the biggest increase in the history of our general elections. 60% of them were under the age of 30, and they made up 25% of the 2013 electoral roll. As of February of this year, 4.1 million of the Malaysians, the majority of whom are young, uh, have yet to register as voters. So one of the tar big challenges that we have facing in front of uh, us in Malaysia is voter apathy and how we can encourage more young people not just to get involved in politics but to take that first step and register as a voter to determine the next government. Of course, registration, we've made, made it very easy and we are still, of course, considering whether or not we have automatic registration and compulsory voting as practiced in some countries. In any democracy, being present and heard when decisions involving your future makes all the difference. Nobody can force you to care. You can either surrender to apathy and complain after the fact of every election or make your voices heard and also influence the future of our country. Apathy is a dangerous affliction not only for the liberty and future of the individual, but also for the well-being of any community and nation in not wanting to take part and not wanting to determine the future outcome of your country. Change, reform, progress, and a better future lies not with those who are timid, but those who are bold and brave enough to take the future into their hands and make the best of it. All good things will not come to those who wait, and you must be passionate enough and want to realize these changes and willing to work hard and make the necessary sacrifices in getting involved in civil society, in politics, and also in youth development. Malaysians are generally an optimistic lot. And this optimism has held them in good stead since independence. We have created a nation of which we can be proud. As Malaysians, we may not agree with the direction of change or where we are heading as a nation, but we have always been able to come together and also bring moments of unity when it counts. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia is a relatively young multicultural nation of about today 30 million people having been formed in September 1963. And this is important because Malaysians always say our independence 1957. Uh, people from Sabah and Sarawak will have a lot to say about that because the formation of Malaysia was in September 1963. The uh, peninsula uh, Malaya gained its independence in August 1957 when 11 states in West Malaysia came together and uh, got the independence from the British. Uh, and the other two states of Sabah and Sarawak joined us together with Singapore in 1963. And of course, two years after that, Singapore was expelled from the Federation. Economically, Malaysia is a country in transition, a developing upper middle income nation with the aspiration of becoming a fully developed country with a high income status within three years. In 2020, our GDP per capita will hit 15,000 US dollar dollars and uh, qualify us uh, to join the club of high-income nations. And of course, uh, the question of being a developed country is not just in terms of your GDP per capita. There are many other markers that define a developed country. But this is, of course, the basic qualification today. If you ask me today in Malaysia, the two twin dangers for young people are apathy, which I spoke of earlier, and also the threat of radicalization and racism. We are currently in the fight for the heart and minds of young Malaysians against the forces of radicalism and racism. 
Malaysia is a Muslim majority nation with Islam as the state religion and the lure of radicalism has its twisted logic. The government of Malaysia and Malaysians are committed to fight this scourge and recently my ministry commissioned an in-depth study looking at how young Malaysians were radicalized into Daesh or what is also known as uh, the Islamic State. We did um, in in-depth uh, psychological, psychometric surveys into those Malaysians who have come back, uh, been involved, gone to Syria, or been recruited, uh, but not yet reached uh, Syria and the Middle East by Daesh uh, and also other uh, terrorist groups. And the picture that we uh, got after this study was conducted was alarming. Uh, although the numbers were small, and the numbers are not more than a hundred those who have been detained uh, under security-related offences, those who have been radicalised, but to me, one is one too many. And it's uh, something that is frightening because the nature of radicalism today is not just uh, group or cell-based, but you can be radicalised on your own and you can act out alone. And this is the greatest fear that we have in Malaysia, to ensure that the lure of radicalization, especially through Islamic radicalization that has been propagated by Daesh, is prevented. And also there are enough policy interventions in place to be able to ensure that not many more or not even one more Malaysian is radicalized. It is something that we view not just in terms of psychological traits, but it also speaks to the heart and soul of the narrative within the Muslim community. The narrative that is propagated by groups like Daesh, of course, is a narrative that is false, but it's a narrative which, as I said earlier, has its own twisted logic that appeals to people, young Malaysians that we found, without any formal training or education in Islam. We found that most people who have profound and meaningful education in Islam are not lured by terrorist groups. These are people with superficial education, superficial training in religion, who are easily influenced by the doctrine propagated by Daesh and the Islamic State. They tend to be people on the periphery, on the margins, and they unfortunately have been the victims of the proliferation of social media. Most of them more than 90% of them were recruited and radicalized through internet sites, through Facebook, and through narrowcast social media like WhatsApp. So this is a big challenge that we have today. In a multiracial democracy such as Malaysia, there is very little that we thought we could do to stop those who unfortunately use religion and race as issues to wedge our society gain electoral advantages or for more nefarious means. There are laws to fight these evils, but the government must approach it in such a way as to find an equitable balance between protecting free speech and liberty and ensuring national security and public well-being. As a multiracial country, we are, of course, a work in progress. A lot of people ask me, where are we in terms of 2020? We had this overarching vision that was conceptualized in 1991 by our fourth prime minister that Malaysia was to be a developed country by the year 2020 and amongst the nine challenges was that Malaysia will be a truly united country, a truly united people. And when people ask me, have we reached that, that promised land of being a truly united people? And I can tell you, and this is the case for all countries in the world, also New Zealand, I presume, is that this is a work in progress. I think no country can stand up there and truly say that they're a truly united country because you have to continue to work at unity. You have to continue to work to ensure that the walls that divide our societies, whether they are based on class, ethnicity, religion, background, whatever it is, they continue to be broken down and new walls crop up all the time and those walls have to be broken down as well and that distrust must continue to be worked on by not just the political process but also by Malaysians and ordinary people. It cannot be denied that there have been incidences since independence 
uh, that uh, have looked and uh, seen to really try to tear apart the fabric of our society. But as usual, Malaysians tend to come together in the worst of times and uh, we always pride ourselves in moments of unity. And what is important in Malaysia is that we try to find more moments of unity. Our moments of unity today uh, very much centre on food and sports. But we have to try to find more than just that. It's not just when Lee Chong Wei wins the badminton game or when we collectively go and have nasi lemak for breakfast. We have to find profound moments of unity, things that define us, not just as an economy, but as a people, as a civilization. And that, I think, will be the big challenge of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the other thing, of course, that we have to deal with, and I mentioned it earlier in the context of radicalization, is the age of social media and smartphones. And of course, young people have very, a very powerful and persuasive platform at their disposal to make their voices heard. Statistics from our multimedia commission in uh, 2016 shows that broadband penetration in Malaysia is at 78%. We're going to try to hit 100% within the next uh, couple of years or so. Mobile phone or cellular phone ownership in Malaysia is 140%. How do you ask? Is it 140%? It means, like me, you have more than one phone. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we are very, very connected and uh, we are very, very uh, plugged in. And uh, of course, all this connectivity and broadband, which uh, has given uh, rise to opportunities, also creates uh, a lot of challenges for us in the political sphere as well. And one of the great things that I enjoy about the rise of technology is that it makes you closer to us and the entire political system has been turned upside down. Today, politicians have nowhere to hide because we are on social media 24-7. And you can have a fair go at us, not just right now, but uh, also 24-7. If you're unhappy, you can troll us. If you're displeased, you can insult us. And there's nothing much we can do uh, except ignore what you've done. There is a very robust online media phenomenon happening in Malaysia today. Those who claim that our old media uh, controlled by the powers that be, and that, uh, that is uh, uh, completely anachronistic. Of course, traditional mainstream media have their editorial viewpoints. Who doesn't? But that's uh, turned upside down as well, because 80% of our young people get their news, real or fake or otherwise, from the social media. And uh, that's the new landscape that we have to operate in. It makes it difficult for governments, because obviously we have to try to ensure that um, Credible announcements, credible news. I'm not going to say real news because you'll say that, you know, who is the government to have a monopoly on real news. But at least credible announcements from us are done in a timely manner and also in a relevant manner. It's not just about being timely. It's about being relevant. Along the days of a long press release written by a Mandarin in a ministry somewhere is over. You're not going to even read that press release. I've got to do an Insta story, whatever that is, uh, to convey uh, policy to you. I've got to do something on Snapchat to uh, convey something serious. But this is, this is the new environment that we work in. And if we don't plug ourselves into social media, uh, it uh, denies that opportunity for you to interact. But more importantly, it denies that opportunity for you to want to be involved in politics because you see politics as in a world that is completely divorced with reality. People operating in silos, people operating in an echo chamber, politicians going about their business without any reality check on their daily lives. Ladies and gentlemen, in, in most political parties, including the members of our ruling coalition in uh, Malaysia, there are of course young youth wings, you have the young nationals here and such, and the membership of this uh, youth wings are between the ages of 18, sometimes 30, 35, 40, uh, and it's, it's not inconsiderable. For instance, I'm the head of my party, the ruling coalition's uh, youth wing. Uh, I do youth in inverted commas because we go all the way up to 40. There's no way somebody who's 39 can pass himself off as young anymore. Uh, but um, its membership is huge. I have 700,000 people under me. I met um, Minister Nikki Kay just now, 
your minister for youth in New Zealand. She came through the, uh, the Young Nationals, her party's youth wing, asked her how many people were the nation Young Nationals. She said, uh, 7,000 people. I didn't have the heart to tell her that I have 700,000 people under me. Uh, but that's, the, that's the, the nature of mass movement uh, political parties that still exist in countries like Malaysia. I know you are very issues based in New Zealand, smaller political parties, more people who are considered neutrals, but we still believe in our mass participation. In Malaysia, the current crop of leaders have come through the ranks of our youth. They are therefore very sensitive, empathize with the voice of young people. They're never ambivalent to the point of view of young people. Um, but we still have quite a way to go. I am the youngest cabinet minister and I'm 41. I was cabinet minister when I was uh, 38. I was appointed, uh, elected to parliament when I was 32. I still think we have a, a way to go. I don't think I should be the only minister uh, in, in his 40s or in her 40s. I think there should be many, many more of us. Uh, but of course, this intergenerational, generational change requires a lot of finesse, requires, requires a lot of compromise. Uh, and it's something that I'm looking forward to at the coming general election, not just uh, from uh, my party, but for all parties. We want to make sure that both our party and parties in opposition have enough uh, of a crop of young leaders, uh, not just because we want to see young people in parliament, not just because young people can empathize with their peers, uh, but also because uh, we want to make sure that we uh, groom and develop young talent early in the political system so you have a steady crop of leaders who can take over in the future and this business of looking at just one person as the future i think is obsolete i think you need to create a pool of young talent any one of which uh, capable enough to lead the country at some stage however knowing that our leaders have once gone through the process of youth devel development is not enough the world since 2010 has changed a lot on various fronts, business, civil society, security, and the internet. But it has affected the core dynamic between government and the people, especially young people. This new social dynamism between the government and young people is built upon a decentralization of power from the government and governing structures to communities and family units. And um, we have a saying in Malaysia, it's not an original saying, it's something that we've just uh, appropriated, which is that uh, the era of government knows best is over, and the era of where the only solutions are provided by the government is also over. So it's very important for us to not just say that, but for our gov governing principles to be based on the fact that we can't give you all the solutions and we don't know everything. And that, of course, begs the question, why do we still need governments? Of course, you need governments to coordinate things, to prioritize things, to synthesize all the ideas that we get. But I think it's very important to empower people, to decentralize that thinking process. And of course, we refine it, and we refine it into policy instruments at the government le level. Government schools are no longer the only place to obtain knowledge as the internet provides the plethora of information at the fingertip of young people. Programs and initiatives are no longer dictated by government through funding as social media allows for crowdfunding of funds and manpower for young people to organize themselves. Government is not the only exclusive entity that can think about public policy since tools of statistics, survey, benchmarking are available to anyone that looks for it. And most importantly, the big institution of government is not no longer solely a boon due to its spending power and extensive machinery. It is now also something that needs to be pared down, something that needs to be streamlined in order to give you better services and also more relevant services for your uh, generation. So I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we've done in my ministry so that you have a better understanding of how we've tried to reorient it, gov reorientate government over the last four years. First, we have this youth development index which is essentially a big data survey that we do about young people across domains, across sectors, across indicators. We have about 60 indicators and that really tells us about what's important to young people. And we use this survey, which we conduct every three years, to sharpen policy instruments and tools. So for instance, if we found out that the socioeconomic domain, or the domain that has to do with political participation, it's, uh, is at its lowest, then there's some investment or policy instruments that can be sharpened to ensure that that goes up over the next three years. And I think it's very important that big data and also statistics drives public policy as much as public views and public opinions are as well. Because without that data, then you're just shooting in the dark. 
Secondly, I've uh, made sure that uh, we try to get as many young people in government as possible, not just as uh, future members of parliament, but uh, through earlier level uh, intervention or earlier level uh, participation within government. Right after the election in 2013, we introduced the Padana Fellowship Program, which has been running for four years now, which allows young, uh, some of our best and brightest, those still at universities, all of you, you can still apply, or those who have just recently graduated from universities, to work and intern as, uh, with cabinet ministers. Uh, this is a great opportunity for young people to come in and uh, to see government up close and personal, not just with the ministers, but the entire machinery of government. We've received more than 4,400 applications and selected more than 300 fellows who have served in, at the highest levels of government. More than 10% were absorbed permanently into the civil service and many of them have gone to do other great things in the private sector. The second key learning is that young people not only want to change the country but uh, through the dry process of policy making but they also want to take place, uh, take part in active debate. So what we did was uh, we set up a youth parliament in Malaysia. I understand you have that in New Zealand as well. The key difference, the one in Malaysia and the one here, as I was told by uh, Minister Kay just now, was that ours is elected. I was one of the only youth parliaments that's elected, elected by their peers online, campaigning online, everything's done online, and they actually have uh, some electoral legitimacy. And uh, youth parliament has been extremely robust, vocal. They actually sit in the proper main parliament building. They debate uh, on motions, and those motions are all tabled to cabinet. And uh, I've made it a point where they don't discuss things at 30,000 feet, very generalized motherhood statements, but they offer solutions at the three feet level, where they have to study uh, papers, prepare papers, and figure out how to fund their programs, and also exercise their ideas. Beyond all of that, We've also set up, because of this desire of young Malaysians to travel the world, to change the world, some people changing the world for wrong reasons by joining Islamic State. So we decided to provide a platform for young people to change the world, uh, but uh, by building communities, by offering services. Um, early in my tenure, I went to Washington and uh, we, uh, we signed an agreement with the US Peace Corps, uh, to which uh, uh, an um, organization called MyCorps has been established. We've already sent a couple of hundred Malaysians to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Turkey, to work in Syrian refugee camps, to build kindergartens and latrines uh, in uh, Cambodia. And this year we're sending more to South Asia to work with Rohingya refugees uh, because we have to provide alternative platforms for young Malaysians to want to change the world. Uh, if you don't offer that option for them, then the lure of wanting to change the world through a devious and dark means becomes all that much more attractive. And that's been a successful youth development program for us. And before I end, I just wanted to also say that uh, there's this wonderful new initiative that we just started, which is also involved in getting young people in nation building. It's called the National Transformation 2050. My ministry has been tasked with uh, starting a national conversation. I hope we can have that tonight, or if not tomorrow night, uh, hosted by the High Commissioner, where I've been tasked to speak with young Malaysians, and also not so young Malaysians, um, about the future of our country. You see, we are a country who have, uh, that has always had one eye on the present and one, one eye on the future. 1971, uh, we decided to embark on a 20-year journey, then called a new economic policy, where we wanted to eradicate absolute poverty. At that point in time, 50% of our population lived in absolute poverty, and today it's less than 1%. And we wanted to restructure the economy so that there was greater socioeconomic justice. In 1991, as I mentioned earlier, there was a 30-year vision to bring Malaysia to 2020, a developed country. So we've always had an eye on the future. So let, there no, let no one tell you that this is something new, this is something that's not been done before. Why are we looking at the future when we have present problems? It's always important for us to project aspirations and anticipate problems. And that's what we're doing through the National Transformation 2050, or TN50, as its Malaysian or Malay acronym is known. So we want to look at the future. 
We want to look at where this, or Malaysia, is in 30 years. I had a fantastic discussion with, uh, with the Minister of Youth, Nikki Kay, just now, about uh, the fascinating debate that New Zealand has been going through about superannuation, and for Malaysians, that's pensions, about thinking about how to sustain superannuation into the future, about whether or not the age for qualifying for superannuation should be increased and whether there should be enough notice, a 20-year runway in giving notice about increasing the age of state pensions in New Zealand. Similarly in Malaysia, we have to start talking about these tough issues. It's not just about changes in technology. It's not just about the aspiration of our economy in 30 years. But it's also to take into consideration changes that will happen over the next three decades that we can only imagine today. Life expectancy will increase. If it's almost touching 80 in Malaysia today, there are some studies that say that we can live up to 100 years old, and that's nothing unusual by the year 2050. And that leads to a bigger question about pensions, about savings, about retirement, about health care, and whether or not we can continue to afford world-class health care at affordable prices and affordable and accessible prices for Malaysians. It asks questions about the future of jobs. When Vision 2020 was conceptualized in 1991, there was no technology like we know today. There was no advanced robotics. There was no artificial intelligence. There was no augmented reality, internet of things, big data. It is said that today, Kids who are in primary school, 65% of the jobs which kids today who are at primary school, my sons, will end up working as, do not even exist. 65% of the jobs don't even exist today. 40% of the jobs that exist today are at high risk to be replaced by automation or robotics or robots. So this is the future scenario which we have to anticipate. Can we have an education system that anticipates these changes? We can't imagine what technological change will be like in 30 years. I speak of augmented reality today. It might be at a pace and scope that is well beyond our comprehension today. But what you need is a picture of the classroom of the future that will equip our kids and be adaptable enough and flexible enough so that they will be able to fill those jobs which don't even exist today. So we have to start thinking about the future, anticipating the future, collective aspirations. And this is the first time ever that the government in Malaysia is looking to the future by asking our people whether it was a new economic policy in 1971, Vision 2020 in 1991, we never asked the people. It was a sermon from the mount from the Prime Minister telling young Malaysians, this is your destiny, this is what you have to do, go out there and get it. This time around, true to the words of government knows best is over, government doesn't have all the solutions, I'm out there asking all of you where you want to go in the next 30 years. After collecting all these aspirations, I've heard about 25,000 aspirations so far, face to face, online, written on post-it boards at our events, People are saying that this is where we want to be. This is where we want to go. Some of the popular aspirations, of course, we want to be a technologically advanced country, embracing robotics, embracing augmented reality, not technology that's imported, but technology that is indigenous, created by Malaysians, not bought, not copied, but made in Malaysia. Other aspirations, they want to be a carbon neutral country by 2050. We want to make sure that our, our carbon footprint is offset by either carbon credits or conservation. We want to have a country where renewable energy makes up more than a quarter of our power production. We want to be a country where healthcare, primary healthcare is world class, where people themselves becomes the guardian of their own healthcare. Today you go and have somebody sick, they don't even know what medicine that they're taking, but we have enough knowledge about what we're taking ourselves. We want to have a country in Malaysia, and this is a very popular one, almost universal, which bans the sale of cigarettes by 2050. Can you imagine that? People feel strongly about that. A nation where we manage non-communicable diseases. Malaysia today, I was having this conversation with Fraser before I started speaking. We are number one in Southeast Asia for obesity, for diabetes, for cardiovascular diseases. So we want to make sure that this preventive healthcare, that fitness, sports, what I look after, is not just seen as fun and games or recreation or you know, a good day out on the field, 
but as that first intervention to make sure that you bring down lifestyle, chronic, non-communicable diseases. These are some of the aspirations and there are many, many more aspirations, some specific doctors who want to make sure that every region, every district, every state in Malaysia has at least two specialist referral hospitals. You don't have to travel all the way to the capital cities anymore to enjoy specialist healthcare. Wearable devices, in, or implantable devices soon, which will be able to send you your heart data to your uh, cardiologist so that you don't have to go for ECG at the heart center. So your doctor can monitor on a 24-7 basis how you're doing. So these are, these are tremendous aspirations. Whether or not we get there, we need to have these aspirations. Government, of course, our job is to figure out which one's real, which one is, which one is uh, realistic, which one is feasible. I was recently listening to a dialogue where somebody said we should have a colony in Mars by 2050, uh, like what Elon Musk is planning. Of course, that might not be feasible for Malaysia. We might want to spend our tax dollars on something more realistic in Malaysia. Uh, but uh, that's the task of government, to synthesize, to syndicate, to prioritize these, these thoughts and these aspirations. But it's important. It's important to have this aspiration. The Prime Minister himself has said, in 2050, we want to be among the top 20 nations in the world. And when I asked him, sir, you know, you've given me this task to talk to young Malaysians and Malaysians to get this bottom-up report, vision document that you will announce next year, so I asked him, what do you mean by top 20? And he said top 20 in most measurements. So GDP per capita, uh, based on purchasing power parity. In terms of the Human Development Index, in terms of competitiveness, in terms of our PISA scores for maths and sciences, in terms of innovation and creativity, and in terms of, this is the most difficult one, FIFA football rankings, top 20. <laughs> that is the one that is most impossible, I told him, sir. I mean, let's be realistic here. But, um, but these, are, these, are, these are exciting times uh, to be a young person in Malaysia. I'm excited for you. Nobody asked me when I was young, your age, what my aspirations were for the year 2020. But uh, here we are. Here we are trying to listen. Here we are trying to understand. And the best part of it is, and I've answered this question many times at dialogues, uh, someone will always ask, uh, raise their hand and say, look, you know, you're coming up with this big blueprint for the country over the next... 30 years over the next three decades. What happens if you lose at the next elections, which is probably this year? And so that's the best part of uh, being a bottom-up uh, vision, is that whoever occupies the seat of government, he, is, he or she will have to respect this vision because it's come from the people. It's not come from this government or this particular prime minister. It's the collection of views, of aspirations about where we want to be as a nation. So, of course, as a politician, although I wish that there is no change in government, but this plan is future-proof in a sense that it is the voice of the people. And uh, it is something that uh, we have to work towards. And most importantly, not only is it the voice of the people, you will feel energized to go out there and make it happen. Because when the final report comes out, you will see your voice in it. And you'll say, wait, wait a minute, that was my suggestion. This is what I agreed to. If it was something that came from a government department, that, that drive, that enthusiasm, that idealism, to go out there and make that change happen yourselves might not be there. But when you see your voice reflected in the future of your country, then I think you'll be not just motivated, but even duty-bound to go and make that change happen. So go and make that change happen. The future is not tomorrow. Don't wait for the future. You're not the future later. The future is now. Thank you very much. Minister, on behalf of uh, Victoria University uh, of Wellington and everyone in the room tonight, I'd just like to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy calendar to be here to talk to us. It was fascinating to hear the challenges that you are dealing with in your portfolios and also that a lot of these challenges are global and that we're all dealing with the same um, issues, and, um, but it's really fascinating to hear how you're dealing with them in Malaysia. So on behalf of the university, I've just got a small gift I'd like to Thank present you, you. and um, I'd like everyone to put their hands together again for the minister.